Hello and welcome to Series 1 of Nahuatl for Aztec Religion. This is the full playlist of the 10 episodes. Starting with the sounds and going into syllables and words, these lessons outline the basics of Nahuatl grammar with vocabularies of the sacred. It will use examples of major deities, ritual practices, and religious specialists, with focus on the classical dialect of Central Mexico and the modern Huasteca dialect of Northern Veracruz. I combine linguistic science with personal experience to make the language accessible for beginning learners. Our first episode will introduce the foundations of Nahuatl sound in consonants. Tla Sinech to Tokakan. Please follow me. The most effective way I have found to learn the consonants of Nahuatl is by understanding two main parts of all consonants the points of articulation and the manners of articulation. These mean where in the mouth you pronounce the sound and how you pronounce it. Hello! This episode of the Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series will show how these two basic principles can get you started on pronouncing all the consonants in the language, specifically the Mexica dialect of Tenochtitlan. The second half will detail the tl sound, and then at the end a goddess's name pronounced with it. This episode will mention other sound features in passing, but these two are the most important for learning Nahuatl. Nahuatl has six points of articulation. Labial with lips, alveolar ridge, postalveolar, palatal, velar, and glottal. Labial sounds are pronounced with the lips p, m, w, qu. With the tip of your tongue, you can feel a slight ridge just behind your upper teeth. This is the alveolar ridge, and it produces six Nahuatl sounds, the most for any part of the mouth. Mm, uh, tss, tss. And right behind this ridge is a slight slope, the post-alveolar point. Shh, tch. The roof of your mouth is the palatal point for the semi-vowel y. Toward the back is the velar point for k, w, and the k sound I detail in my video on Miktlantegutli. And the final point is the glottal, used to pronounce k, a consonant distinct to the Mexica dialect. Contemporary variants of Nahuatl often pronounce this as h, a flow of sound instead of a stop. This chart represents the consonant inventory of Mexica Nahuatl. Notice how it lists the points of articulation at top, from the front of the mouth at left to the glottis at right. These cross against the manners of articulation. Linguists may break these levels down into further groups, but I have simplified this list for beginners. Stops are short releases of sound made by blocking part of the mouth. P, T, K, K, K. By contrast, fricatives are steady releases of sound against part of the mouth. S, SH. We pronounce nasals by closing part of the mouth and sounding through the nose. Mm, mm. Approximants get their name from parts of the mouth that come close together to create a sound, but not entirely. In Nahuatl, they include the lips nearing together to form w, the sides of the tongue toward the palate for l, and the top of the tongue approaching but not touching the palate to say y. Notice that the q and w are listed as both labial and velar consonants because you need both the front and back of your mouth to pronounce each. Last in this set are affricates, which are pronounced by combining a stop with a fricative at the same point. Tss, k, ch. Let's now talk about k, which learners often find the most difficult to pronounce. An important tip for pronouncing the TL of Nahuatl is to realize that it is not a separate syllable. It is not said tol. It is not a T and L, but rather should, it should be pronounced as a single consonant. And to pronounce it, we should remember the point of articulation as well as the matter of articulation that I discussed in the past slide. And so let's start with the point of articulation. What I'd like for you to do is put your, the tip of your tongue against the ridge right behind your front teeth, behind the uh, upper jaw. 
there is that alveolar ridge that juts up right behind your teeth. That is where you pronounce, for example, the N, the S, and also the L. So if you put your tip of your tongue against that ridge, you can start to pronounce the L sound, which is very common in English and many other European languages. Once you re uh, realize that point of articulation, what you can now do is instead of pronouncing it like a voice L, what you should then try to do is instead of breathing out with the voice in your voice box, let the air flow out the sides. So it's not L, but rather so you can feel the air, the breath, coming out the side as you put the tip of your tongue against the ridge. You can feel the breath of air, the flow coming from the sides. That is why it is called a lateral alveolar affricate, because it the lateral means that the voice, the wind, is coming through the sides of the tongue. So that is how you pronounce the which is a fricative. It is a steady flow of air. But the TL is actually an affricate, meaning that it begins with a stop. And so what you're going to be doing then is once you have that point of articulation, now you should close up the roof of your mouth with the size of your tongue and then release so that it begins with the stop and continues with the frication. It continues with the flow of air. So it is first the and then the flow. And together, if you release it at the in the proper timing, you can create that sound. But it is short because it is just that one consonant. So with some practice, you can begin to pronounce the sound, which occurs at both the beginning of so many syllables in Nahuatl, but also at the end. In fact, it is in the very name of the Nahuatl language. So with that, you can start to get a hang of how to pronounce this very important consonant that we'll be uh, referencing uh, throughout this uh, course on Nahuatl for an Aztec religion. And with that in mind, I'd like to turn to, uh, because this is a series about Nahuatl for Aztec ritual worship and religion, let's look at an example of an Aztec goddess whose name has five distinct points of articulation, and we can close the video with this example. Matlalcueye was a name for the water goddess among the Aztecs of Tlaxcala, east of Mexico City. Her name means she wears a dark green skirt, referring to jade beads symbolizing water. This image shows where each consonant is pronounced. The name is noteworthy because it has consonants representing five of the six points of articulation and four of the five manners I have listed for Nahuatl. It recalls a premise from the start of this video. Learn how to combine at least the point and manner of articulation, and with a few more details you can begin pronouncing any consonant in Nahuatl, or indeed any other language. I use the colons to mark long vowels, which will be part of the next episode of Nahuatl for Aztec religion. Join us for the following installment on the vowels of the language. Nahuatl has four main vowels, and this short video will make a few comments about how they are pronounced. If you are familiar with Spanish, the vowels of Nahuatl will sound very similar. E, E, A, O. Hello! Because this series is dedicated to Nahuatl for Aztec religion, I start this episode with a goddess whose name has all four pronunciations. Xochiquetzal. Xochiquetzal. Her name means flower quetzal, a reference to the elegant green plumes of the famous tropical bird. At right is a simplified chart mapping the vowels of Nahuatl by two dimensions, the place of the tongue in the mouth from front to back, and how far the jaw opens from top to bottom. I have color-coded the vowels to where they sound in the name, and I sampled the colors directly from the painting itself. However, a feature of Nahuatl vowels not found in Spanish or English is length. In English, we might pronounce a short vowel, e, and a long vowel, i, but most Nahuatl dialects, including Mexica, pronounce their long and short vowels identically. The only difference is how long the vowel is sounded, and this rule applies to all four. We know that vowel length matters in Nahuatl because the language has minimal sets for it. Linguists use minimal sets to test when sounds are contrastive in a language. If a couple words had the same set of sounds except different at one position, 
and speakers recognize these differences as words with different meanings. Then the sounds are distinct. Listen to the following word pairs and notice the differences between the short and long vowels, because the words mean different things. She week, she week, she week, leaf, turquoise, or year. She week, comet, new, 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 your beans, new. He or she got up and left, or he or she woke up and got out of bed. Tlaka, 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 or rather, I didn't mean it like that. Uh, let me put it this way. Tlaka, people or men. Toka, 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 to follow, but in some dialects it also means to have sex. Toka, furry. For more examples of long and short vowel pronunciations, please watch my Now What Word of the Week playlist. Now that we have explored the consonants and vowels of Now What, a new question appears. How do we write them? The next episode will make a few remarks on different approaches to writing, and the one that we will be using for the Now What for Aztec Religion series. Join us for the following installment. We we teot. The Old Man Spirit is one of the oldest Mesoamerican gods in both history and mythology. This episode will show examples of how writers have spelled the name of this ancient fire god since the alphabet arrived into the Americas five centuries ago. Hello! This video will look into a few of the most important conventions for spelling out Nahuatl from colonial to modern times. It will also discuss the main benefits and disadvantages of each for learning the language. Then it will end with my reasons for choosing the orthography or spelling style we will be using throughout the Now What for Aztec Religion series. Most of the colonial texts on Aztec religion were written specifically to document survivals of indigenous practices so that the church could prevent them from contaminating the converts' faith by erasing them altogether. Because so many writers were coming from different backgrounds, including native Nahuatl speakers learning to write in the Spanish alphabet, the first texts were inconsistent with spelling rules. Their only common trait was the attempt to write this foreign, Native American language with familiar letters from the Spanish alphabet. This is a good moment at which to point out an important idea in writing the names. The Spanish often used two letters to represent W, the W, with or without the initial stop. When the sound started a syllable, the U followed the consonant letter. However, when the sound ended a syllable, the U would precede it, as with the example for eagle, Quautli. Examples occur in the two best known names of the Aztec fire god, Wewe-teot and Xiu-tegutli. Notice that the Ws are spelled H-U in the first case because they start each syllable. In the second, the W and Qu and the first and second syllables, respectively, and the letters are reversed to UH, UC. Another quick note about the earliest writings is that they were inconsistent for the glottal stop, <coughs> but they used the letter H when it did appear. Without this letter to represent the sound, the combining noun root for the fire god could be read as either Wei Wei, drum, or Wei Wei, old man. Given his elderly physique, the meaning is clearly the latter, so the glottal stop should be included. As in the first written texts, the letters are easy to produce, but the spelling requires either contextual foreknowledge or educated guesswork when the reading is ambivalent. By the 17th century, the alphabetic script for Mexica Nahuatl saw more vowel markings to indicate either length or a following glottal stop. A macron, the horizontal bar over a vowel, represents a long vowel. Both the grave and circumflex characters meant that the vowel precedes a glottal stop. A grave if within the word, a circumflex if at its end. And don't worry about trying to combine these markings. A long vowel never precedes a glottal stop in Mexica or any other Nahuatl dialect that I've studied, so there would never be a case where you'd have to combine the macron with a grave or circumflex on the same vowel. It is both concise and consistent. We can economize the letters and still read the exact pronunciation with precision. At the same time, the vowels are tricky to type on modern devices unless you have a European setting or shortcut keys. 
The 1645 grammar by linguist Horacio Carocci remains a seminal resource for Nahuatl grammar because it relies so thoroughly on this convention. It is systematic with its presentation of sound, an essential practice for modern linguistics, which takes us to the 20th century. The first Nahuatl course I took was in 2002, and that was the first time I had studied the language without the traditional Spanish alphabet. The course took a structural linguistic approach, beginning with the most basic units of sound and advancing to more complex patterns of grammar. This is in fact the approach this Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series has taken. In true linguistic fashion, each sound is transcribed with a single letter, or two for affricate consonants such as tz, ch, and t. The priority is one-to-one -one correspondence. With the Spanish alphabet, the S could be written with a C, Z, or even the Cedil. Inspired by the international phonetic alphabet, the linguistic approach assigns the S itself. Because even modern dialects of Nahuatl recognize short and long vowels, these must also be marked, and the colon is a reliable symbol for it. Here are the fire god names as written with phonetic alphabet characters. I will admit that this convention is the most transparent for linguistic study and textual interpretation, but it looks foreign and distant from the conventional spellings used over the past 500 years. Another reason I hesitate to apply it is because it's not as widely used or familiar as the old Spanish styles. This transcription is phonetically correct, but it would be much harder to find with today's search engines unless you actually knew what you were looking for. I conducted fieldwork in anthropology and linguistics in the Huasteca region of northern Mexico, and I was looking at subjects of supernatural, ritual, and other religious topics, many of which I look to incorporate into this Now What for Aztec Religion series. While I was doing my fieldwork in the area, I got to work with many school teachers and other educators who became aware of my interests and subjects, and they were also among my most important collaborators and participants for my fieldwork. Among the, th the contributions that they gave me was this, text, uh, was this textbook, and this is a, um, from the Department of Public Education, and it is written in the Huasteca dialect of Nahuatl for the first grade. I bring this up because this is an illustration of the orthography that is used to teach school children in bilingual settings. They are learning both Spanish language and the indigenous language. One part I wanted to point out is toward the end of the textbook, which has some activities and readings for the school children to learn with. And in this part, uh, the uh, title is called the Wewehtlakat, which means the old man. And uh, this is a combination of the Wewe and the Tlakat, both of which have uh, masculine connotations, but combined in this uh, single word uh, has, uh, carries a sense of an elderly man. And I wanted to point out, if I can kind of bring this in here, the um, spelling with the U's, very similar to the original classical writings, such as those found in Sahagun. So in a sense, this brings us back full circle. It is looking for an orthography, a, an, an alphabetical spelling that approximates the sounds of the Nahuatl language with characters that are comprehensible and familiar to, uh, to learners of the language. So uh, you can see that in other places, it is using um, the Ks and the Js. To, to reflect the sounds of the language. One last point that I wanted to show on this page is the way in which Wewehtlakat is spelled. Notice that there is a J, which is cognate with the uh, the glottal stop that is, we heard in the Mexica dialect. That is because in the Huasteca dialect, the glottal stop is still present in a cognate form. It is no longer pronounced as a stop, as the uh, but rather it is aspirated, it is, an, it is a fricative, so it is pronounced more like the H of English and spelled with the J of Spanish, so this would be sound more like wewehtlakat. Also notice that there is no marking for vowel length. This is something that, this in, that the speakers would intrinsically know how to pronounce so they would understand through context where to insert or where to read the long vowels because they would be unnecessary to include if you are learning to become a first language speaker of, the, of, of uh, Nahuatl. Otherwise, you would have to know from context how to pronounce long vowels as they are implied in texts such as this. If you have watched my other videos on the Aztecs, you may have already seen my style for spelling Nahuatl names. 
It draws from the original Spanish system because it is the most popular, certainly for many of you. Yet it also represents the glottal stop with H and long vowels with colons. My convention thus combines from different times and purposes, but I find it the most useful for these videos for two reasons. One, its characters represent all the phonemes or sounds significant to spoken Nahuatl. And two, the characters are easy to write, without the constant need to copy and paste special markings from other sources. So, returning to the two names of the fire god, I spell them like this. This is the orthography for the Eye of the Serpent channel. The next episode in the Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series will return to the linguistic approach as we upscale from the basic sounds to how syllables put them in order. Join us for the following installment. While letters are a language's most basic units, it is the syllable through which they begin their weave into elegant patterns. Hello! This episode of the Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series will outline three basic rules for learning syllables in the language, with a couple examples from ritual words. We'll also take a special look at the pronunciation of Tlaxolteotl, one of the most important Mesoamerican goddesses from ancient to modern days. Before we get started, a quick note about how I will be writing for this video. When linguists want to break a word down to its syllables, they often separate it by dots. This series uses hyphens instead for convenience. Rule 1. The Nahuatl syllable has one pattern. This notation indicates that the vowel is always required, and the initial and final consonants are optional. A word with a full CVC syllable is tletl, fire. This word, however, has all four syllable forms, in teocal, their temple. Rule 2. A side effect of the first rule is that multiple consonants cannot happen at either the start or end of a syllable. Earlier forms of Nahuatl may have allowed this exception, and a possible example is the word for filth, tlaxoli. Centuries ago, it was likely pronounced with two consonants in front, so. However, as Nahuatl began to apply the syllable rule across all its words, this separated the consonants to two syllables the glottal stop ending the first, the s starting the second. And also remember rule number one. Every Nahuatl syllable requires a vowel, so one had to be inserted in front, and this is usually the I, E. Linguists call this rule a penthesis. This e so root was then adapted into two forms, the verb with the inserted I, e so loa to mistreat, and the noun tlaxoli, refuse or filth, which readily replaced that I with the tla prefix because it was inserted just for grammatic convenience anyway. Rule 3. A word's penult, or second-to-last syllable, is almost always stressed. Tla sol teot means spirit of refuse or filth, whose literal translation is the subject for another video. In the Mexica dialect, the most familiar exception to this rule is when somebody is calling a person by name. If the speaker is female, the final syllable is stressed instead. Tlaxolteot. If the speaker is male, the stress is on the added suffix e. Tlaxolteotle. This is called the vocative form. And an interesting side note, this e suffix is used the same way in Yucatec Mayan, which suggests that one of these languages may have borrowed the form from the other. Other exceptions to the stress rule are rare, and often to a single or couple words in each dialect. Once you master these three basic rules for forming syllables in Nahuatl, you will have already set a cornerstone in your foundation to speaking the language. Now that we have explored the sounds and syllables of Nahuatl, we can begin to form full words. Join us for the next episode about basic examples of the noun. Plain se tlatoli. What is a word? Hello. For a Nahuatl course I took in 2002, one of my first reading assignments was an article by Marianne Mithun about the qualities that words share in all languages. I then understood why her article was so important for beginning to learn Nahuatl, for a Nahuatl word can carry a heavy, even daunting amount of information. So this episode in the Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series presents five useful rules for learning how words work in Nahuatl. Mithun's research inspired the approach, and I link to a chapter by her in the description box. Rule 1. A word has a complete form. 
To start, let's look at the following examples from English. Fear can stand alone as a basic noun. English speakers recognize it as a word that by itself refers to an emotional reaction to perceived danger. In addition, it can receive suffixes to build the word into a new form with additional meaning. Attaching the less suffix produces the word fearless, now an adjective for lacking fear. This can still receive the ness suffix, which reverts the word to a noun form fearlessness to indicate the state of lacking fear. Let's look at one more English example, but in reverse. Fecklessness is a state of showing disrespect. Removing the ness suffix yields the adjective feckless, or showing disrespect. But this is the word's basic form. There are no modern English dialects that would remove the less suffix and recognize feck as a freestanding word. It sounds incomplete and therefore ungrammatical without at least one suffix. Now an example from Nahuatl. Xikal is the root for gourd bowl, but presented this way, the word is incomplete. It needs at least one prefix or suffix to count as a complete word. So we could add the li suffix to it, which is an absolutive suffix that would then yield the word xikali, which is gourd bowl, just as an independent noun. Or we could add a possessive prefix such as no, my, to the beginning of the word. So you could say no xikal, which is my gourd bowl. So either of these forms, she kali or no she kal, counts as a complete word. This noun root form can even be attached to another word base, in this case a derived verb. She kal koliuki means gourd bowl curve, a geometric pattern used in ancient Mesoamerica. This is also a fully formed complete word. Rule two, a word can have stress rules. Many languages have regular stress patterns that keep spoken discourse in rhythm and words in distinction. Stress rules help separate words because they cue when a new one is about to start or end. Most Mayan languages stress on the final syllable, and Nahuatl stresses on the penult, the second to last syllable. Rule 3. A word has boundaries. Following from Rule 1, native speakers will know when a word is complete and therefore ready to end. In fact, languages limit how many parts can be added to a word and in what order, as we will see with Nahuatl in an upcoming episode. Rule 4. A word has spacing. A word's syllables are tightly sounded because they are cognitively combined. All the parts of a word are thought together and therefore spoken together. By extension, to separate words requires slight pauses among them, distinguishing one group of sounds from another. This excerpt on the Tlaloque rain gods comes from Sahagun's Primeros Memoriales. I pampa mi toaya Tlaloque intech tlamiloya yehuan ki chiwa in kiawit. You can grasp each word with such cadence, and you can write them in the same manner. Rule 5 A word can express an entire sentence in Nahuatl. While I was attending a village ceremony in North Veracruz, an elderly lady told me, Mi tla copal wis. This means, I will apply copal incense to things, all expressed in a single word, with the meaning and stress rules listed earlier. With these rules for forming words, we will make basic sentences with the person prefixes and suffixes. Join us for the next episode. Hello, and na mech tla palos. Picking up from the last episode on words, this episode in the Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series will introduce three pronoun sets used for nouns and verbs. By the end of the lesson, you will be able to make simple sentences in the Nahuatl language. A quick disclaimer before we start. This is not the complete pronoun system in Nahuatl. Other sets, such as the imperative, reflexive, and independent pronoun sets are subjects for later episodes in this series. Let's begin with three important tips for mastering the pronouns of Nahuatl. 1. The Nahuatl pronouns we will learn in this episode specify for both person and number. The person types are first, second, and third, and the numbers are singular and plural. 2. Gender, such as he, she, and it in English, is not part of the pronoun system and must be understood through context. And 3. Every Nahuatl subject pronoun wraps around a word base with both a prefix and a suffix. Linguists therefore call this a circumfix pattern if you want the technical term. The prefix marks for person and number, and the suffix marks for number alone. 
we will use tlakat, the word for person, to conjugate the person in number pronouns for subject cases. Ni tlakat, I am a person. Ti tlakat, you are a person. Tlakat, he or she is a person. That's right, there is no pronunciation for this pronoun. But that doesn't mean nothing is there. This is a null prefix because the position is still occupied and understood, but it has no sound. Linguists mark null components with a zero to reflect this idea. Ti tlaka, we are people. An tlaka, you all are people. Tlaka, they are people. Notice how the singular forms end with the tl suffix and the plurals end with the glottal uh suffix. We will look further at singular and plural noun forms in the next episode. Like the subject cases of the last list, the genitive pronouns are also prefixes. Genitive pronouns mark possession, and they are a simple set. For this case, we will use the word for mother. Nonan, my mother. Monan, your mother. Inan, his or her mother. Tonan, our mother. Amonan, your mother. Inan, their mother. Bringing us back to Aztec religion, some of you may recognize the latter phrase as part of the goddess name Te Teo Inan, Mother of the Spirits. The genitive prefix often drops the O when it precedes a vowel, especially the A and E. These examples will use A Moshtli, book. Na Mosh, my book. Ma Mosh, your book. Ia Mosh, his or her book. Ta Mosh, our book. Amamosh, your book. Imamosh, their book. And to round out our lesson on pronouns for this episode, we should finally look at the object prefixes used for verbs. In the following cases, the subject is singular third person, so the prefix is null and therefore silent. This will allow us to focus on the object pronoun prefixes, which also mark for person and number. Nechnoza nonan. My mother is calling me. Mits noza monan. Your mother is calling you. Ki noza inan. His or her mother is calling him or her. Tech noza tonan. Our mother is calling us. Amech noza amonan. Your mother is calling you all. Ki noza inan. Their mother is calling them. A final point worth noting is that the third person singular object, which in English would be him, her, or it, is basically the k prefix. Before another consonant, its pronunciation will depend on what precedes it. Remember from the episode on syllables that a consonant cluster cannot happen at the start or end of a syllable, so a vowel has to be present. In the first case, the e from the pronoun ni keeps the k at the end of the first syllable and the n at the onset of the next syllable. Nik noza in okichpili. I am calling the boy. In the second case, without a preceding vowel, the k has to be separated from the n. So the e vowel is inserted to separate these consonants into their own syllables. Ki noza in okichpili in idan. The boy's mother is calling him. If you find this a lot to process, I encourage you to practice forming basic sentences with the subject, genitive, and object pronoun sets we've covered in this episode. Upcoming episodes will also review these lessons. The next episode will make a few comments about noun suffixes. Join us for the following installment. Hello, and Piali. This episode in the Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series will look further into nouns, namely important lessons on two of their most common suffix sets. The noun suffixes in this episode will be focused on two cases, the absolutive and possessed forms, in both singular and plural. They may look daunting at first, but this video will show how basic ideas about Nahuatl consonants and vowels will make them easier to learn. In the spirit of the series, we will even use several examples from the Aztec supernatural world, including the shape-shifting Nahuali and one of the most important names of Tezcatl y Epoca. Even a casual glance at the Nahuatl language would reveal a good number of words ending in tl, tli, or li. These are suffixes that mark a noun's absolutive form. 
Absolutive means that a nowat noun takes subject prefixes and suffixes, similarly to intransitive verbs, verbs without objects. Returning to an example from the last episode, let's compare the singular and plural forms for the noun tlakatl, person, and the verb nemi, walk. Ti tlakatl, you are a person. An tlaka, you all are people. Ti ne nemi, you are walking. An ne nemi, you all are walking. Notice how the noun and verb receive similar prefixes and suffixes for person and number. The plural sets are identical here. The noun and verb take the same prefixes and a glottal suffix. We will return to verbs in the next episode. A fully formed noun in Nahuatl always has at least three parts. A subject prefix, the noun root, and some type of suffix. It may also take additional prefixes, suffixes, or other attachments, but the first three are minimally required. We find all three from our recent example T Tlakat. T marks the second person singular subject. Tlaka is the noun root for person, and the T is the singular absolutive suffix. Set together, the noun's components make a full sentence. Ti tlakat, you are a person. For most Nahuatl nouns, the root's final letter determines the absolutive suffix form, and this follows three general rules. 1. If the root ends in a vowel, the suffix is tl. Eekat, wind. Siwat, woman. 2. If the root ends in a consonant, the suffix is tli. This may remind you of the syllable rule stating that Nahuatl doesn't like a consonant cluster at the start or end of a syllable, so it will add a vowel, typically the E, to break it up. Amoshtli, book. Itli, obsidian. Osomatli, monkey. 3. If the noun root ends in an L, the Tli will assimilate to Li, because Kopali is easier to say than Kopaltli. Kopali, incense. Tonali, calendar day sign. I have a quick aside on rule two. Although most consonant final noun roots take the tli suffix with the e at the end, a few exceptions insert the e before the tl. Kwawit, wood, tree. Shiwit, turquoise, year, leaf. So just be aware that these cases exist. Before we turn to plurals, I said these three rules apply to most nouns because Nahuatl also has a special case of in for certain animals and other animate beings in nature. Michin, fish. Totolin, turkey. Sitlalin, star. Nouns that can be marked for plural take one of the following three main forms. Glottal, me, din. The rules deciding which form to use are loose, and some words can even take one or another, such as me shi'tin or me shi'ka. But four trends guide the plural patterns. 1. Inanimate, collective nouns do not mark for plural and therefore do not change the suffix. Tamali, tamales. Et, beans. 2. Noun roots for animals, spirits, and other animate beings take me. Tsitsimit. Tsitsimime, a type of malicious spirits. Tsinakantli, Tsinakanme, bats. 3. Consonant final noun roots receive tin. Kali, kaltin, houses. Komali, komaltin, komal grills. 4. And nouns related to people are often pluralized with the glottal uh. Siwat, siwa, women. Pochtekat, pochteka, merchants. Some nouns are pluralized with reduplication, which typically repeats the first syllable and lengthens the first vowel. Kowat, kokowa, serpents. Teot, teteo, spirits or gods. Nawali. Na nawaltin, shape shifting nawales. The final set for this episode are the suffixes used to mark when a noun is possessed. 
If you watched the last episode in this playlist, you may remember the genitive pronoun prefix, which is used to mark possession. The noun therefore requires at least this prefix to mark who possesses the object, and at least a suffix to mark that the object is the thing being possessed. Nawat has three suffixes for the possessed noun, and the general rules are easy because they follow patterns for sound and number. 1. If the noun root is singular and ends in a consonant, the suffix is null. This means that the suffix position is occupied, completing the noun form, but nothing is pronounced. My tamali thus takes the no prefix and drops the li suffix to say no tamal, my tamale. Same with no mich, my fish. 2. If the noun root is singular and ends in a vowel, the suffix is h. Istat is salt, and to say my salt, we replace the absolute of tl suffix with the h to show its possession. Also notice that the e at the start is weak, so it is dropped when it receives the no prefix. My salt is then pronounced no stau. Another example is shotik, flower. To say my flower, we replace the tl suffix with h for the flower possession, and the no prefix indicates that it is mine, no shotiu. And three. If the possessed noun is plural, the suffix is wan, regardless of the root's final letter. My komal grills are then no komal wan. Let's return to the noun tlakat, which means man or person. His or her person then adds the e prefix to mark third person singular genitive. And the noun root, which ends in a vowel, replaces the tl suffix with hu. E tlakau. To say his or her people, we must change the suffix from hu to wan to show that the noun is plural. This entire word could be said as a full sentence when you remember that the third person subject prefix is null and therefore not pronounced. However, other plural subject prefixes can replace it, such as the t for the first person plural we. With this prefix, we form ti tla kawan, we are his people one of the most important nicknames of the god Tezcat y Epoca. These rules for noun possession also apply to exceptions that will be discussed in episodes ahead. The next episode will introduce one of the most important foundations to understanding the Nahuatl language, the verb. Join us for the following installment. Hello and Namech Tlapalos. This episode in the Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series will introduce five lessons on verbs in the language. The entire second playlist on Nahuatl for Aztec Religion is dedicated to verbs, so this episode will offer just a few basics on how words are built around them. With these, you can begin to form entire sentences with this part of speech. 1. Every verb, with a few exceptions, has one subject prefix. A subject marker is required for almost all verbs, and it is always in a prefix position. This position cannot have two or more, only the one. You may also remember from earlier episodes that a verb may be correctly conjugated even when no subject is pronounced. This is a null prefix for third-person subject he, she, it, or they. For this part, we will apply the subject person and number markers for kisa, to leave or exit. Nikisa, I leave. Tikisa, you leave. Kisa, he or she leaves. Tikisa, we leave. Ankisa, you all leave. Kisa, they leave. I chose this image because we will return to details around the god Huitzilopochtli further into this episode. The only exceptions that have no subject are a few verbs related to weather, such as kiawi, rain, and tona, sun. 2. If a verb requires an object, it will be a prefix somewhere between the subject and the verb base. Some verbs may take a single object, but special forms can take up to two, and a few rare forms may even allow for three. This example will use a verb expecting just one object, namiki, to meet or encounter. For the interest of consistency, let us assume that the subject is the deity Quetzalcoatl in this plate from the Codex Borbonicus. The subject will be the third person singular, so both the prefix and suffix will be null and therefore not pronounced. This will let us focus on the object prefix forms themselves. 
Net na miki, he meets me. Meets na miki, he meets you. Ki na miki, he meets him or her. Tech na miki, he meets us. Amet na miki, he meets you all. Ki na miki, he meets them. Another sample to consider is I meet him or her. Nik na miki. Notice that the k object is at the end of the syllable because it follows the vowel from the ni prefix. The k object and the verb's initial n can follow each other because they are pronounced between two vowels, each in its own syllable. Compare this with the k object of ki na miki. Here the two consonants couldn't be pronounced together because what doesn't allow for clusters such as kna miki. In this case, the object prefix inserts a vowel to break up the consonants. And this vowel is usually the E, here spelt with I. 3. Aspects and tenses, telling the manner and time in which the verb is performed, are suffixes. what has a rich set of verb suffixes that can detail a particular action the verb was performed with. The sun is tonatiu, goes along casting sunlight. A couple aspectuals can mark the progressive. Kui katikate, they are singing. Past and future tense also affect the end of the verb, with suffixes or other modifications, even further when the subject is plural. Ti te o la miske, we will play the ball game with others. 4. Most nahuatl verbs belong to one of four classes, each following distinct inflection and suffix rules. All four classes will be explained in series 2. In the following examples for each verb class, I will pronounce a verb phrase first in the present tense and then in the past to show how they differ. Class 1 verbs form past tense with a glottal suffix. Te o mama. Te o mama. He carried a god upon his back. In this illustration, we tzilo pochtli. Class 2 verbs drop the final vowel for past tense. Nik tzotzona in teponastli. Nik tzotzon in teponastli. I struck the teponastli drum. Class 3 verbs replace the final vowel with a glottal stop. Ki tla tlautia in chaltiwit ikwe. Ki tla tlauti in chaltiwit ikwe. He or she prayed to chaltiwit ikwe. Class 4 verbs form past tense with a k suffix. Ki, kik. He or she drank it. 5. The verb is central to Nahuatl grammar. One of the main reasons I dedicated Series 2 to verbs alone is because many of the rituals and specialists of Aztec religion are derived from verbs. Our present case is one such example. Te o mama could mean he carried a god upon his back, yet this term also named a priest charged with carrying a god image as for a pilgrimage. Now what is a verb heavy language, and the examples used in this episode should illustrate how easily a single verb can express a full sentence. Now what also has ready patterns for verbalizing nouns as needed, just like the English word verbalize itself. The next episode will briefly look at now what noun combinations, such as nouns on verbs. Join us for the final full installment for series one on now what for Aztec religion. Hello and welcome to the final full episode for Series 1 of Nahuatl for Aztec Religion. Noun combination is one of the most productive and even poetic qualities of the Nahuatl language. Similar to German, Nahuatl has remarkable range for adding nouns to other words to modify them in certain ways, by bringing a level of meaning that can be literal or figurative. As I have found examples from the 16th century to the present day, I will bring them from both ends. This video will outline three major types of noun combination. 1. Noun upon noun. 2. Noun upon verb as object. 3. Noun upon verb as modifier. Staying in the spirit of the series theme, most of the examples for this episode will have religious and spiritual relevance. If you haven't yet seen the episode on now what nouns, I encourage you to watch it because I will be referencing its main lessons here. In the episode on noun suffixes, I spoke of the noun root, its basic part, to which prefixes, suffixes, and other morphemes may be attached. A noun's root form may exist separately from these parts when it is combined to another word, 
always in the preceding position. One type of incense burner is tle ma'it, combined from the nouns tlet, fire, and ma'it, hand. To merge these into a single word, the first noun drops its absolutive suffix, so tlet becomes tle, which can then combine with ma'it to form the compound noun. Many Aztec deities have names following the same rule, and here I give a couple examples. Chaltiwit means precious green stone, especially jade. We drop the absolutive suffix it for the noun root to combine with totolin, turkey hen. Chalchu totolin, jade turkey hen, was a sacrificial goddess. Notice that the name ends with the absolutive suffix in, so it may still act like any other noun in Nahuatl. And the most famous example of this rule is none other than Quetzalcoatl, Quetzal serpent, whose name comes from the lavish green feathers of the Quetzal bird in his titanic serpent body. Often when a noun combines with a verb, it will take the object position, as if to say that the verb is acting upon the general sense of the noun, not a specific instance of it. The following two verbs pertain to ritual activity, and in both cases the verb may be conjugated to name the practitioner. Tlasa is a transitive verb meaning to cast or hurl, and it may take a specific object, as in ki tlasa im sinachtli, they cast the kernels, referring to a specific set. But when the noun is incorporated as an object, it has a general meaning. Hail is tesiwit, and its combining form is tesiu. Tesiuhtlasa is to say that the person magically casts hail as a general practice, not referring to any particular storm. This verb may be derived into the preterite form tesiuhtlaski, a sorcerer who causes hailstorms. For a contemporary example, the verb tlalia means to set down. As before, we can incorporate a noun to indicate the setting down of a general kind of thing, in this case, shotit, flowers. We thus use the combining form shoti with tlalia to say the verb shoti tlalia to set flowers down, namely for ritual decorations and offerings. In the modern Huasteca dialect of North Veracruz, this verb can also be derived to name a ritual practitioner. The shoti tlalket is a flower setter and indicates one who prepares such arrangements for indigenous costumbre ceremony. The following two examples use names of body parts to modify the respective verbs. Notice that the noun doesn't become the default object, but rather modifies the verb while it keeps its object position. Both words include meanings about thought. Adding the noun ikshi for foot to the verb toka to follow produces the verb ikshi toka, literally to follow someone's footsteps, but with additional senses around learning, investigation, and even examining your conscience. One of my favorites returns us to the verb namiki, to meet or encounter, as we explored in the last episode. The word for liver is eli, and the noun root may be combined with namiki to produce the verb el namiki, or more commonly il namiki. And in this form, the verb means to remember. It takes the same objects as namiki itself, as in nimits il namiki, I remember you. However, the il noun gives the verb the literal meaning of meeting with the liver. Why? What does this have to do with memory? The Aztecs believed that the liver was the seat of human thought and emotion, so you access them by meeting them through this organ. Likewise, to forget is il kawa, which is to leave something from the same body part. As we delve further into the language of ritual and the supernatural, noun combination will become important to recognize, especially to understand when it conveys literal and or symbolic meaning. I give one final example of noun combination in the next episode to present today's mask. Join us for the conclusion to Series 1 of Nahuatl for Aztec Religion. Today's mask presents the exquisite visage of Tlaloc, the principal rain god of the Aztec and many other Mesoamerican civilizations. Excavated at the Aztec Great Temple in the year 2000, Offering 102 yielded a trove of exceptionally preserved ritual objects in stone, shell, ceramic, paper, and other materials. This display, which I saw at the Great Temple Museum in 2018, reflects the original arrangement. 
The mask is the most impressionable work from the ensemble, and we can detail a couple of its features with Nahuatl lessons we have covered through Series 1. The main word for mask in Nahuatl is Shayakat, which is also the word for face. Shayakat follows grammar rules explored in parts of this series, such as the pronunciation of long and short forms of the A vowel, the stress on the penultimate syllable, and the absolutive suffix tl, which follows vowels. Shayakat. Recalling our last episode, another Nahuatl word for mask uses noun combination. The Colonial Codex Koskatsin names a mask with the word kwau shayakat, a compound noun made from the roots kwau, wood, and shayakat, face. Kwau shayakat then means wooden face. Another compound noun names part of the headdress. Highlighted in green is a decoration called ama kweshpali, a fan of pleated paper worn at the back of the neck like the tresses of hair worn by young men. Its name comes from the noun root for paper, ama, which is combined with kweshpali, the tress grown out from a young man's neck. Said together, the name is ama kweshpali. Many other deities wore similar ornaments in the ancient Aztec world. If you have been following me through Series 1 of the Nahuatl for Aztec Religion series, we will return with Series 2, which will look in detail at Nahuatl verbs. Please like, share, and subscribe to the Eye of the Serpent channel for updates. Your Patreon support goes toward travel, research, and production. Thank you for watching, and good roads.